Awesome. Awesome. Well, good morning, family. Let's go ahead and stand up on our feet. We know others are going to be joining us. No others are going to be joining us, but man, just so stirred in my heart. We, we're full on having service in, in pre-service prayer in my office, just feeling the presence of the Lord so tangibly in the room. And just want to honor that, want to steward that and just lean in today and something that as, uh, as I was sharing it with the team this morning just began to stir in my heart and I said you know what I feel like I want to share that even as we begin I'm, I'm going to read Psalms 34 it says Lord I'm bursting with joy over what you've done for me my lips are full of perpetual praise I'm boasting of you and all your works so let who, all who are discouraged take heart Join me, everyone. Let's praise the Lord together. Let's make him famous. Let's make his name glorious to all. Listen to my testimony. I cried to God in my distress, and he answered me. He freed me from all my tears. Gaze upon him. Join your life with his, and joy will come. Gaze upon him. Join your life with His and joy will come. Your face will glisten with glory. You'll never wear that shame face again. Can somebody say thank you? You'll never wear that shame face again. When I had nothing, desperate and defeated, I cried out to the Lord and He heard me. Bringing His miracle deliverance when I needed it the most. The angel of the Lord stooped down and listened as I prayed encircling me empowering me and showing me how to escape he will do this for everyone who fears the Lord drink deeply of the pleasures of the Father experience for yourself the joyous mercy he gives to all who turn to hide themselves in him worship in awe and wonder all that you've had and all of you have been made holy for all who fear him will feast with plenty. Even the strong and the wealthy grow weak and hungry. But those who passionately pursue the Lord will never lack any good thing. As we were praying before service, we talked about what it is that we do when we come before the Lord to worship. When we come before the Lord, the, the word that we use a lot is the word magnify. King David in the Psalms writes the word magnify as much if not more than he writes any other word magnify and this I know what I'm about to say sounds super elementary but it's important when we magnify something when we set our, our the, the magnifying glass <laughs> if you're if you're like me as I'm progressing you might already be there but it doesn't make the words on the page any bigger when I put the readers on it makes the words on the page bigger to me when I magnify the Lord and I place the magnifying glass of my heart straight into the goodness of His eyes and the love of His presence and the fire of His affection to me, how many know it does not make God any bigger? We cannot make God any bigger. He's perfectly big enough. What it absolutely does is makes Him bigger to me. And what we've been taught in church is that we come and we place the magnifying glass on our needs, on our struggles, on our circumstances, on our past, on what we're going through. And then we try out of the periphery to talk to God about all the big things going on in our world. And it's a complete inverse warped view of what worship really is. Worship is taking all of the attention away from those things that belong in the periphery and setting the, the eye of my heart to magnify the Lord. To magnify Him. To exalt Him. To place Him in the center of my heart. To place Him in the center of the room. Roll out the red carpet and celebrate His presence because it is oh so worth celebrating. So I just want you right now to join me as we lift our hands. And I just want you even right now to place Him and place your affection and your attention and the eye of your heart straight on the Lord. 
not on what you're dealing with, not on what you're going through, not even on what you came today hoping and believing that he's going to turn around in your world. Yes. Yes, he's going to do all of those things. I, we came today with expectation of healing. That the, that the bondage and the lie of anxiety is being baptized in the assurance of the love of God. But right now, we just set our gaze on you, King Jesus. You alone are worthy. So right now, just in your own language, begin to magnify you. In your own language, begin to lift your heart. In your own language, begin to lift your voice. He wants to hear your song today. We worship you, King Jesus. We magnify you, King Jesus. We lift your name high, Jesus. Be glorified, be exalted, King Jesus. Let joy circle this room. Let liberty fill the room. We magnify you. 
something when we were at, under the oaks that just kind of like stuck with me. I'm probably going to butcher it, but he said, our stories are way too significant to just come in here on a Sunday morning or a Tuesday morning prayer to just give, you know, our casual worship. And so if any of you are having like issues engaging or like finding yourself in that place of just being able to just like pour it all Think about your story. Go back and remember. Think about the timeline that he's been pr so present in. And I, pro I promise you, it'll be so easy to pour it out. Your story is way too significant.
feel your affection I want to get lost in you Cause you're my obsession When I lock eyes with you I feel your affection I love to get lost in you
just stay right here. Let the Holy Spirit just minister to you right now. Hope is being infused right now. I feel like the Lord is just ministering personally to you this morning. Let's just stay here. Just stay engaged. Stay engaged. Let your heart remain tender and
of his glory come. It's the weight of your presence, Jesus. Thank you. Had a word come that just said this. The Holy Spirit is coming to speak in, to check in to the on those who have autoimmune disease. And I felt this was significant. It says that some have felt a measure of relief, but feel the weight of that creeping back in. And the Lord says to you today, you're not here this morning by mistake. We're just going to begin to believe that a little more of that is just be incrementally beginning to be healed, continually being healed, a process of being restored into wholeness. Feels like for the last several weeks, every time we come in here, I just keep hearing migraine headaches. And so we just right now receive the promise of the Lord by, that there is healing in the name of Jesus. So right now we just receive that God we declare in this room right now every physical body every need wholeness from the inside out wholeness from the inside out every whew, intestinal problems because of stress and anxiety He's healing the anxiety and he's healing the root of that issue. But I pray that I declare right now, even the stump, the symptoms of that weight and stress being healed in the presence of Jesus. We thank you, Father. Thank you that you still heal. You still deliver. You still set the captives at liberty. We bless you, Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe just for 30 seconds in your own voice and in your own language, can we just tell him thank you? Can you just tell him thank you? Audibly in your own language, in your own heart. This is what he longs for. He doesn't want you to sing along with the songs. He wants to hear from his children. Thank you. Thank you. stay in this posture of worship. I want you to greet somebody around you. Say hello. Give them a hug. Introduce yourself. You see somebody you don't know. Hallelujah. So grateful, man.
Jesus. I'm going to have y'all stay with me for a minute, y'all. Awesome. 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 Good deal, guys. Let's go ahead and find our way back to our seats. and We'll kind of process some quick announcements, some giving, and then we'll go ahead and get our awesome kids out. joining us online. We love you. We got some texts even from some of my family that's home today sick. And uh, so we're just praying strength over them. And um, in, in that, I don't want to go another moment. We had, um, we've got two, two awesome reports just in the last 24 hours of, of the Lord here, you know, answering our prayers and beginning to just move through this family praying. One of those is right back there, Miss Scarlett. So thankful. Scarlett is the baby, not the one with, with their hands up. Uh, Alex is baby girl Scarlett. Um, and uh, just began to pray in the middle of the night. Alex said, he, uh, I loved um, Caitlin's testimony on the group, on the community page. It was just like she, he woke up, she woke up with him. And right before he was going to give her medicine, felt the Lord say, just pray as a confident son. And uh, she woke up that morning completely fever free. Super, super thankful. Thank you, Jesus. Um, um, Addie Brown, who uh, Cody and Ashley's daughter, um, was having some breathing problems um, this week. Had to take her in. She just this morning is getting taken off of the high flow oxygen, low flow O2, and then they'll be going home. They believe today. So that's super amazing. That timing is important. That timing is important because. Uh, we've got baby Blakely being induced Wednesday. So they cannot be in the hospital. We can't have one in the hospital while mom's in the hospital. So just uh, there, uh, I said, they, they sent me a, a, a text today celebrating and their, pers- their, their humor, the way they laugh through everything that most of us would just get so spun out about is just amazing to me. Um, but the two of them, I don't know if, if y'all have ever had to stay in a hospital but like the little chair that turns into a twin bed. It's a joke. And uh, But Cody and Ashley, she's ten months pre- nine months pregnant. They're sleeping on that together. And so I'm like, y'all's pregnancy stories are going to make a great Lifetime movie at some point in the future. So uh, just celebrating God. What we've got to become, what we've got to become is a people who don't just know how to cry out in passion, but know how to even more so lavishly say thank you when the Father answers the cry of our hearts. Amen. And so it's just so perfect, even what I feel led to teach this morning. So, um, yep, thank you guys. Thank you, Miss Mary. Up on the screen is, is how you can partner with us in, in giving today. And uh, here, if you need an offering envelope, if you give by cash or check, I know there's a handful that put cash in every week. I cannot encourage you enough. Take the few minutes, put your name and your address. If you've already done the name, address, phone number thing, just put your name on it. Put the cash in there and get credit for that at the end of the year for your tax-deductible donation. Take a credit. Take advantage of that um, as much as you can. So we'll get ready. Those that, If you need an envelope, when Wes, just raise your hand and we'll get one to you. Um, and uh, just so incredibly, incredibly thankful. I'm going to bless the offering this morning before I go over our announcements quickly just to kind of take care of time. We are coming into a day where the Lord is moving and rearranging and and giving whispers of revelation and wisdom. We talked last week about how significant and how important. In fact, we met with Dominique this week, Jamie and I, talking about even where we feel as as leaders where we really want to see an influx of attention go, uh, even in our mastermind group, where I want to really dive into learning the, the, how to marry wisdom wisdom and faith 
Hear me, I said wisdom. Say wisdom. Not common sense. If it comes from the Lord, it's not common. And no one says amen. Praise God. If it comes from Him, you can't call it common. But there is practical places where the Father invites us into a place of trust. And when I say that we've been, Jamie and I, we feel like we've been liberated from the religious uh, uh, confinement of tithe, it doesn't mean that the principle of sowing into God's kingdom and reaping His promises is different. It's just the posture comes from gratitude, not fear. I give, and to the outside eye, all of that looks the exact same. It's the internal conversation that's different. I'll say it again. It's the internal conversation that's different. I used to give out of fear of what would happen if I did not. But when I see Him for who He is, the Abba exclusively revealed through Jesus, some thing of generosity, of trust and of faithfulness begins to rise up in me and while the giving might look the same, the posture of my heart to say thank you is the difference and he rewards a cheerful giver, he rewards a cheerful happy giver so we're not doing this to twist your arms because we're so desperate about paying the bills, we're not we're doing this because we're so desperate to see you know the peace that surpasses understanding specifically as it relates to your finances and business and so we, we, we are testimonies of how God takes little and makes much out of you remaining faithful over him. I, I'm on Do you know the verse that says, be faithful over little, I'll make you rulers over much? In Bible college, they taught me that that meant be faithful over five youth kids, Kevin, and then he'll give you a, a church of a thousand people. It's not how that verse is intended. It's not he get, it's this. Be faithful over little and watch him in glory make much out of you remaining faithful over little. My five loaves of bread and two fish. And it never stops amazing me what he can do with my five loaves of bread and two fish. And so we just encourage you this morning to, it's right to sow and honor and turn back and say thank you for all that the Lord is doing. So I want to bless that and let Wes and the guys wait on you and then we'll go over some announcements. So Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are raising up a family of generosity. You're raising a family that knows how to be grateful, that knows how to be thankful, how to hear the whisper of the Lord. So this morning, Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak to us. Speak to us about what to give and where to give and how we're putting our seed into good ground that knows the faithfulness of the Father cannot be matched. So, Father, I break the lie of fear off of our finances. I feel that. Let's say that again. Father, I break the spirit of fear off of this family, specifically as it relates to finances. I say you are Jaira. I say you are faithful. And you are instilling your nature into a family in the middle of North Texas that are going to know you are God and we trust you with all that we have so we thank you Father let every need be met every, every dream we sow seed into seeing everything accomplished according to your plan and your purpose we bless you Father in your awesome name Amen and Amen thank you guys y'all can do that while they're passing real quickly this morning we'll go over a couple of announcements as always we've got Tuesday morning prayer right here in the sanctuary we come in the side door here uh, to not interfere with the school Tuesday morning 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. right here in the sanctuary we're having a blast with that Jamal gets up and just ministers over us by way of song sometimes we've got um, Ray will jump up Ashley will jump up sometimes when she's able to attend we just flow I try every week almost to get Jamie to get up and we're still waiting for that to happen but we just have we just get into this prophetic swirl and it's just really really beautiful so join us Tuesday morning prayer Wednesday we've got our junior youth which is ages 10 to 14 at 6 30 to 8 parents if you have any questions about that group Miss Stacy would you raise your hand right here you don't recognize her because she's got straight hair today instead of her crazy curls she told me that just shows you I have got it done and I so 
then it'll go back to crazy. So when you see her Wednesday, it won't be her twin. It's her. Just she'll have a, she'll have the curls. Uh, and then Jalicia, where are you at? You might be taking care. There you are. Thank you. Miss, those will be the two. Howls are obviously still very involved. Caroline's still very, very involved. But just parents, if you need to ask questions, uh, it's an amazing thing. My kids come back every week just so thankful uh, for that group. So if you have questions, see them. That is a perfect opportunity. Parents and high school age students, it's our time to get fired back up. So we are so stirred in this. So um, parents, in the day, very soon, we're going to be having, uh, um, getting those kids together, or high school kids, um, that, that age from like 15 up through senior year. We're going to have a time where we just get together and dive into the nature of God, who God is, and worship together. So parents of kids in that age, if y'all have questions, right now just see me. You can see Tammy. Tammy can help direct you to me. And then Nick's going to be involved. We're just going to have this whole, this this moving room of, of, of leaders come and pour into this age. So we're super excited. So um, be, be paying attention to that in the days to come for more communication. And then finally... Our women's group, which is going to be ladies on April 20th, 420, praise God. We're going to meet. Why are y'all laughing? Y'all shouldn't know what that means. Women's group is going to be at 1030, and we are reading, we being Jamie, uh, this book by Baxter Kruger called Home. Unbelievable. So has anyone already got it and started reading? couple of us. I love it. I love it. Alex, you cannot show up to women's group, um, but I'm glad you're reading the book. Um, so ladies, this will be posted again this week. If you need help, if you can't afford this, it's 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 a couple of dollars on Amazon. If that's an issue for you, don't miss out. We'll buy it for you. I will buy it for you. So just let me know. This book is amazing about the Father's presence welcoming us home. So this is so, so good. So um, if it, I think Jamie said, if you can't read it all by then, it's okay. Just get it started. I promise you, if you're, I'm not a big reader, but the, I could not put this down. I read it very, it's only, a, it's, it's this big. It's this big. So big writing, small text. It's my kind of literature. So um, if you have any questions, see this. It's awesome. So um, I think that's all of our announcements today. Thank you, guys. Let's go ahead and dismiss our Homestead kids. That's walkers up to fifth grade. You guys are going back. We've got Marcus and Catherine. Catherine's with the babies. Marcus is with our saplings today. Miss Amber's with our sprout, our oaks, I'm sorry. Our older group. Our mighty oaks of righteousness. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Guys, as we're just waiting on to settle in. Let's just, can we go back into the I Exalt Thee? Can we just sing through that together? And... Also, just as we're getting ready to transition even into the teaching this morning, he, the Father's so present. I just want us to just remain we used to see the, the, the this was so this idiotic, the song service, the song service to help prepare us to hear from the man of God. So stupid. How stupid. The only reason I am beneficial to you is to help you learn more of who you are, more of the nature of the Father so you can engage more in worship. It's, 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 it's so silly how we've made it all about the guy teaching. It's all about Jesus. And the only reason that we stop the flow of worship to teach is to help you engage even more. So I want us to even just for another moment as they sing over us, we're not just readying our heart. We're readying our heart to be expanded, to let the Holy Spirit come and tenderize the wine skin to help us stretch. Why? Not so that we can say, my God, what a great message, but so that we can hold more of the wine of His Spirit. Amen? So let's just sing through this again. Just, I exalt thee, so grateful. Let's just
Father, we welcome you again. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would carry the word of the Lord today into the deepest inner place of our heart. us as you're tenderizing us to be stretched for the purpose not to say we're stretched but to stretch for the purpose of holding more so we lean in we lean in today we thank you that your word is still speaking over us that you are your word over us is still a better word we honor you today, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. In your awesome name. Amen. Amen. Guys, thank y'all. So unbelievable. Unbelievable. Can we let them know how thankful we are for their faithfulness, their heart. Man, it's amazing. So grateful for Jamal and this team and just just amazing, man. Thank you. Happy to have David, Big Daddy David, back on the stage. Been on paternity leave. We're glad that he's back home, back with the crew. Although Jamal brought up a good point. You know, we're like, man, we've missed you, blah, blah, blah. And then Jamal's like, you know, I remember when my babies were... We should be telling him you're welcome. Like now he gets to just show up at 8 o'clock to, to minister. Mama's got the real work this morning, but man, we love you guys and love what the Lord is doing. I, um, man, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in. I love you. So glad that you're here this morning and uh, just so stirred in my heart. Um, I wrote a lot, so it's going to be a little different this morning as far as that. I, I'm, I wrote quite a bit uh, this week in my office and I'm, I feel like I'm supposed to read that just as I felt it when I was writing it. I, for men, for the guys that were here with me on Wednesday night, um, we had a blast, minus the way too hot chili. Um, I said, dude, our, our, our congreg like your pastor's far too Caucasian to handle such spice. And I said, what did you put in here, Andrew? And he said, pepper. Like, it's just pepper. I'm like, no, it's absolutely phenomenal. But if you were here, there was a joke. The food is amazing. And, um, but I am a sissy when it comes to spice. Like a straight up sissy. Jamal was like could, I mean just scarfing it. I'm like how how can you guys do this? And like everyone else, like no one's even like maybe Chris. Chris is a little sis with me. Um, but just then I had to get up here and teach with just straight acid reflux coming up out of my so I felt like that probably hindered a little bit of what the anointing wanted to share. So no, I got home I I, I so this will sound, I joked with them, I said, this will probably sound real familiar come uh, Sunday morning. I got home, and, and Jamie and I, the next morning, were having coffee, and she's like, how was men's? How did the service go? What was that like? And as I began to share, even as the Lord spoke, she's like, I know you don't use, usually do this, but I think you're, you're thinking you should do that again on Sunday. I go, yeah, I'm wrestling with that. And she said, I know you should. And so that, there's my Holy Spirit confirmed by my Holy Spirit. And um, so I want to jump in this morning. And uh, just read. So here we go. Family, I feel such a significant weight as a leader in your life and over this family to turn our attention today to our responsibility to steward what God is doing among us. This is a significant outpouring, a movement, a worship and revival culture. And therefore, we have to see it and operate within it, how we see it and how we operate within it must shift. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, common about this family and about what God is doing. And it cannot be handled as such. I believe we are inheriting a grace to deeper our honor and with His lens... Resolve, resolve to remain content and expectant. A grace we must lean into in order to steward well. 
So we've been talking over the last several, well, for a long time. So we talk a lot, specifically when we're teaching about how we read Scripture. That we are to put on our lens of Jesus. Right? Thank you. Like, by God, do we need, we'll go back. We put on our lens of Jesus, and when we, even when we go into Scripture, specifically in the Old Testament, and, and when we go into the Old Testament, we don't ever throw out that, that idea, ideology that the Old Testament is not important is ridiculous and dangerous. What it is, however, it, we must accept the invitation to put on Christ, go into the Old Testament, be able to read those through the lens of the Father who was just the same as He is now back then. We don't have time. We won't get it, have time, but we will in the days to come to go in. We need to understand God did not change at the fall in the garden. Man did. It's huge, and it's going to be huge about where we go today. But God never changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever everlasting. Jesus did not change. Man's idea of God absolutely did. Jesus came to restore our broken lens by which we saw the Father. And so... But not only are we to put on Jesus when we're seeing the Father, we've got to put on Jesus when you look in the mirror. you got to put on Jesus when you look around this room. you got to put on the lens of Jesus when you think about what the Father's doing. Because if we're not careful, we'll be another culture who measures everything by measurables. Who gauges involvement and engagement. Based upon things I can see, count, calculate, and weigh. But when I put on Jesus and I look in this room this morning, something in me knows this thing is shaking. When I put on Jesus, I'm able to go, this thing is significant. This family is important. This family has such promise and potential in the presence of God. And so I know I'm not just talking about the culture of a handful that's with us in this room. I recognize we are establishing a culture that's supposed to be generational. We will hand this to the next generation. And it will be healthier than it is ever in our hands when we hand it to them. Amen? And so we, we've got to see this thing rightly. Like, as, as, like Jamie being, being an embodiment of the Spirit of God to me because she constantly refuses to allow me to even use communication that minimizes what I know as God is doing in this room. My tendency is self-deprecation. If you've been here long enough, you know that's my sense of humor. That won't change. My self-deprecation is, is, is part of my personality. However, I, that, that innately has a tendency of minimizing greatness. And I'm not talking about on myself, but I'm talking about specifically as it relates to this family. There's significance here. And I don't want to be the guy who overhypes. And the, the, the problem with not wanting the fear of being the overhype guy is I'll swing the pendulum in the far other direction and minimize the greatness that I feel in this room. And I don't want to do that anymore. So we put on the lens, not only of Jesus, not only for Scripture, not only for the Father, but yes, ourselves. We must see us and this room rightly and stop minimizing Greatness. Now, if we're going to talk about stewardship, first we need to understand and as a family be able to together define what kingdom stewardship is. So let's go to Matthew 25. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Matthew 25, and I'm going to read verse 14 through 30 together real quick. So Again, heaven's kingdom realm is like a wealthy man who went on a long journey and summoned all of his trusted servants and assigned his financial management over to them. Before he left on his journey, he entrusted a bag of 5,000 gold coins to one, to another 2,000, and to a third 1,000, each according to his ability to manage. The one entrusted with 5,000 gold coins immediately went out and traded with the money and doubled the investment. In the same way, the, the one who he entrusted 2,000 gold coins traded with the sum and likewise doubled the investment. But the one who had been entrusted with 1,000 gold coins 
dug a hole in the ground and buried it and buried his master's money. After much time had passed, the master returned to settle accounts with his servants. The one who was entrusted with five gold coins came and brought the 10,000 saying, See, I have doubled your money. Commending his servant, the master replied, You have done well and proven yourself to be a loyal and trustworthy servant. Because you have been faithful steward to maintain a small sum, now I will put in ch- you in charge of much, much more. You will experience the delight of your master and you will say, Enter into the joy of the Lord. Then the one who had been entrusted with 2,000 gold coins came and said, See, master, I have doubled what you have entrusted to me. Commending his servant, the master replied, You have done well and proven yourself to be a loyal and trustworthy servant. Because you were faithful to manage a small sum, now I'll put you in charge of much, much more. You will experience the delight of your master you will, who will say to you, Enter into the joy of the Lord. Then the one who had been entrusted with 1,000 gold coins came to his master and said, Look, sir, I know that you are a hard man to please and you are a shrewd and ruthless businessman who grows rich on the backs of others. I was afraid of you. So I went and hid your money and buried it in the ground. But here it is. Take it. It's yours. But his master said to him, You're an untrustworthy and lazy servant. If you knew I was a shrewd and trust and ruthless businessman you all, who always makes a profit, why didn't you deposit my money into a bank? Then you would have at least received the interest when I returned. But because you were unfaithful, I will take the 1,000 gold coins, give them to the one who has 10,000. For the one who has been given more until he overflows with abundance. And the one with hardly anything... With him, little will be taken from him. Let's just stop there for the sake of time. So here we go. Kingdom stewardship. Understand this is about more than gold coins. Yes? Okay. Kingdom stewardship is always, and I mean always, about growth, honor, and partnering with the Holy Ghost to see supernatural multiplication. Stewardship in the kingdom is not about maintaining. It is always about expanding. Not simply lose it, but grow. So how do we grow this? How do we grow this movement? How do we grow what the Lord is doing? How do we grow personally and corporately all that the Father's investing into us in this day? Number one. Our goal today, as I told the men on Wednesday night, our number one goal today is to be liberated from the lie or the notion that it's possible you can fail. I want to see you free from the fear of missing it. I want to set you free from the fear of of losing what God is doing in you. And what God's doing in this family. Because this is what happens. The, the, obviously, the, 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 the man represents the father. And the one who does not steward well is the one fearful over who he is. The one who doesn't know how to steward is the one who doesn't see him right. Why do we teach such constantly about how to see the father? Why is theology about the nature and the goodness of God so important? Because if you don't see Him right, fear will govern how you engage with Him. Fear will cause you to be so afraid of retribution and and, and judgment that you do not know how to engage and partner with Him. It's just huge. The only one who doesn't double the investment is the one who says, I know you to be a difficult taskmaster. Someone had to teach you how difficult he is. You're difficult. You, you, you're, you're, I'm scared, so I buried it. I hoarded it. I, I, didn't, I didn't engage with it. But look, here it is. I haven't lost it. And in the kingdom, stewardship is always about multiplication. Yes, that's financial. Yes, the Lord wants you blessed and multiplying this. But we also have to see that as the gold coin of the promise that he's whispering into a family. 
It's not simply about don't lose it. So number one, I believe that we are going to be liberated today from the lie and the notion that you are going to fail. Fear and self-sabotage causes us to stop short no more. We're going to learn today, this is not up to you and my, you, yours and my's effort, but we're going to learn how to lean into grace. That was much better news than you responded with. This is not up to our effort. This is up to us leaning into grace. It is all grace. The, the Western church mind struggles with this. The legalistic slant. It is all grace. It is is all grace. One day, I'm going to say that, and this is just going to throw a party. We're still working through. Most of you were raised, we're in the South, in the Bible Belt, and we were raised to be sinners saved by grace. Sinners in the hands of an angry God is the most popular message of the 20th century. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. And we are being restored when someone recently, not that long ago, was in a conversation with me and they were talking about what God was doing in their life. But they said something interesting. They're like, this new message of, that you and you Damon and his family shares, it's just doing something. This is the most orthodox message in the world. This is not new. We're recovering. This is what John the Beloved believed about Jesus and what he believed about the Father. And maybe one day I told Jamie I want to do maybe just a Saturday where I'll take you through the history of where we started getting off track with the legalistic slant. Right around, <laughs> right around 1611 when our King James Bibles came out. And we began to be slanted into a degree of fear of God instead of holy reverence of a father who had welcomed us in. And so we're learning, we're recovering that lens. Why? Because he is inviting you and I to partner with him and grow not only what the Lord is doing here corporately, but what he's doing here corporately is a byproduct of what he's doing with you personally. I'm not interested in growing a great church with a bunch of dysfunctional people. I want you in such a measure of wholeness that when we come into this room, it's a celebration of all that he's doing to you with you in private. That is a, a success to me as a leader. It is not more people, more finances, more groups, more fame, more clicks, more likes. It's you becoming authentically who the Father has dreamed and designed for you to be from the beginning. You fully alive is the only reason Jamie and I would ever dream of doing this. I promise you it's not for financial gain. It's not for popularity. It's not for more friends. No, it is not. What is it for? It's because we passionately burn to see you become all that the Father's dream for you to be. Your marriage to be so wrapped in the love of God that you keep doing what we find ourselves doing constantly, which is not that everything's always been perfect. It's not that we've had the most amazing marriage every day of our life. No, grace made sure we got to this place. But we find ourselves now pinching ourselves, just randomly driving down the road, just wanting to make sure I'm, this is real. I'm not dreaming. This is the greatest days of my life. This is what we're dreaming of for you. Yeah, we, we, you know, it's very important. Jamie and I, when, when we talk about our marriage, we don't do the church thing where we're like, oh, we want you to have, no, no, we're, we're living a dream. But we want to be honest with you and say it has not always looked like a dream. Well, a dream, nightmare at some points, but it's still dreaming. <laughs> but grace, but grace gave room for me to put down the facade of the mighty man and just be vulnerable and honest. And when I was wounded and broken and sad and had self-destructed, I found grace embodied. And now we're stepping into this. So we don't say this to make this great chasm between us, the great leaders, and these normal casual people who are struggling through their life. Our life is we're one step ahead of where you might feel like you are. But I'm telling you, our, our life is a witness. There is more available. So, so at Tuesday prayer, Tuesday prayer, I'm, I'm having a conversation with the Lord. I show 
uh, Wes some things I was writing. But I asked the Lord, you know, how do I help steward what we're doing here? And the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord spoke this to me. And then I want to dive into this. And that's going to be where we're going to go today. It says this, that the end of revival is seductively hidden in the leaven of familiarity. That the end of revival, yes, corporately, but we're talking personally today, is seductively hidden inside the leaven of familiarity. We know the, we know the, the old saying that familiarity breeds contempt. Its, its definition would be an inappropriate, often offensive informality. Now, here's where I want to jump into for just a moment because it's so, so important. There's tension with this because I just told you you're a beloved son and daughter. So there's tension here. So... Am, am I able to come in familiarity with the Lord? Absolutely I am. But I just told you familiarity has a tendency of breeding casualness. So there's tension here. Am I a beloved son? Yes. Is there a responsibility to come with reverence and honor and awestruck love? Yes. Yes. This, this is so important. There's tension here because there's and revelation lives in tension. What do I mean by revelation lives in tension? The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent taketh by force. Unless you come as a child, you cannot inherit my kingdom. That seems very counterproductive. Am I violent or am I like a child? Say it with me. Yes. Violently becoming childlike. So there's... There's tension here, but it's so, so good. We are, yes, we come. How, how, so how do we see this? Well, first of all, we're going to learn today how to see it like Jesus taught us to see it. Which, number one, we come boldly. Say boldly. Uninhibited. Unafraid. Unashamed. We come boldly, but I don't come casually. I, Jamie... Why, she had no, I mean, she, I guess that, that's a lie. She didn't know what I was teaching, didn't know where exactly we were going. She sent me this today. It's from the book Home by Baxter Kruger, all of our ladies. <laughs> how, how do, yes, we come boldly. I'm assured and I'm included, but I'm not flippant or undervalued. So I'm, I'm bold to come face to face with the Lord, but I don't do so without understanding how beautiful it is that I'm included. And that stirs an honor in me. Not a fear, but a holy wonder of I am included in this fellowship with the Father, Son, and Spirit. Baxter wrote this. This, it is currently not cold or sterile. And it is far from being the kind of language that triggers hesitance, hiding, or mere outward performance. Look at this again. Thou art my beloved Son in whom my soul delights. This is the language of a full heart, of passion, acceptance, and delight. It is the language of fellowship, of hurried inclusion, of embracing, of mutual adoration and real affection. It reveals a passionate encircling love which generates freedom to be known and reaches expression in a communion of intimacy, familiarity, and complete togetherness. The old adage, familiarity breeds contempt, may well be true in certain circumstances. It is not true with God. What we see here is acceptance and love expressing itself in a communion of extinguish, of, of, a communion of exquisitely thorough familiarity in the Spirit. So we have been invited, so I'm familiar with Him. I'm familiar with him. I know him. You and I are invited to know him with the same togetherness as Jesus. But we're going to learn here in just a moment through this how Jesus approaches the Father while so in union and in so familiar, not scared, not unhinged, not nervous to come, but he comes rep rec representing human flesh, representing us to be enfolded into this. But even Christ shows us it was a really big deal to him. 
And when we talk about the culture here, what is the culture? There's zero fear allowed in this room. Fear carries with it a sense of punishment. Perfect love is celebrated in this room. The perfect love of God is celebrated in this room. But what are we supposed to do? We don't come flipping about that. We roll out the red carpet in every opportunity we have and say, Jesus, be enthroned in this place. Be enthroned in this place. It is such a big deal that I'm learning that I don't have to be scared of the Father. That something in me doesn't get casual about that. Something in me wants to come even more boldly. Amen? All right, we'll keep going. We'll keep going. So how does Jesus do that? Let's look quickly at how he teaches us to pray, Matthew 6. Everybody good? All right, we've got a long ways to go, so hang with me. I'm going I'm to get through it. This is some important stuff. I know what it's doing in my heart. Here we go. Matthew 6, Jesus teaches this. When you pray, let's go. Hey, let's just go now to um, perfect, verse 9. Pray like this. Our beloved Father, dwelling in the heavenly realms, may the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. Manifest your kingdom realm and cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on the earth. Just as it is in heaven. We acknowledge you as our provider of all that we need each day. Forgive us of our wrongs that we have done as we ourselves release forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Rescue us every time we face tribulation. Set us free from evil. For you are the king who rules with power and glory forever. Amen. So this is what we would call the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Prayer. Most of us would have been raised, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. Watch how Jesus is teaching in the first first verse. Verse 9. Mary, we can go back to verse 9. He's actually teaching us the remedy of casual. Pray like this. Number one, how does Jesus teach us to approach the Father? By calling him Abba. Now... We've been raised to pray this prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This could not have been more scandalous when Jesus was teaching his disciples. If I was to go to a single moment beyond when Jesus looked to the scribes and said, You search the scriptures, you search the book, and know not that those books were sent to reveal me. Before Jesus, besides Jesus saying, oh, I am the law of Moses, this would have been the most scandalous, offensive, anger-inducing comment that Jesus would have ever taught, which is when he taught people to pray, he says, first, where they were taught to say, Adonai, creator of the universe, great God, far off, almighty God. Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this, Abba, Patier, Papa. This is what children would have called their dad. Father, Abba. Abba, Patier. This is so scandalous verbiage of the closeness and the safety of union that we are invited into. He is the Father. And you are fully included in that fellowship. Jesus invites us into the same relationship with the Father that he celebrated. His Father. Man, that's so good. Joyfully and fully included. This is what sets our hearts ablaze. So he says, Papa, Abba, my Father, dwelling in the heavenly realms, or our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So he goes straight from, I can approach you as a father. And the very following thought is, you are father and you are the creator of all things. You're holy, glorious, full of wonder. So he goes, he's teaching us that we are freely engaging with the father. But we do so from a posture that knows the one I am included with is not just a Far off distant God, he's father, but he is the creator of all things. Holy, set apart, and different. So important, guys. This is so good. Okay, let me read this footnote and then we're going to get rolling. 
An alternate reading of the Aramaic text here, the, the word is name. This is Shema, the Hebrew word Shem, a word of multiple meanings. It can also be translated light, sound, or atmosphere. Placing a light, a lantern, in an enclosed space magnifies that light. This is the meaning here of God's name being made sacred and magnified as we focus our lives on Him. The Greek word is, you are to be treated as holy. It's not generic. I'm not, I, listen, don't, don't, what, what, did we, what did we do? Like when I was in Bible college, when I was in Bible college, in this, and I was coming up in, in the ministry, everyone in this prayer movement that we were a part of, everyone was so, I'm just going, like I was in this. These are my people, my tribe. So this is not me making fun of a culture. This is me being honest about what I was in. All of us turned a little British when we prayed. Oh, God. This is real. Every one of us made it G-O-T. Oh, God, we love you. Like, we, we, I'm not talking about a generic, oh, God, far, far and wide, you great distant. That's not how I speak to my father. So, I, so I'm not, I'm not saying don't, don't do what we did in religion, which is take the pendulum to this place where you separated us by chasm and great divide. No, it's, it's Father. The kingdom life that is within me. You're holy. And I set my, the center of my universe around the fact that you are God. I set the center of my world on the revelation that you're the father of the universe and you have included me in this fellowship. This is what ignites passion. This is where true passionate approach and union of fellowship that knows how fully you belong. And that's what makes me honor it even more. Let's watch Jesus here. Luke 5, 6 teaches us that often Jesus would withdraw alone to spend time with the Father. How much praying did God need to do? How much praying did God need to withdraw to soak in the understanding that he's a beloved son? How much did God need to do that? Pretty... Pretty amazing witness of, of the significance of it within ourselves. Let's go to Mark 1. I'm, I know we're going through a lot, but I, man, I feel like this is so important. The next morning, this is early on, Mark 1, 35. The next morning, Jesus got up long before daylight, left his house while it was dark, and made his way to a secluded place to give himself to prayer. Later, Simon and his friends searched for him. And when they finally tracked him down, they told him, everyone is looking for you. They want you. So let's think about what we're watching here. Jesus would wake up early in the morning. It's the middle of the night. Still dark outside. He would wake up and sneak out of the presence of his disciples to go give himself to honoring, what is prayer? Honoring the union with the Father. Jesus would sneak away to soak in the beloved nature of the Father and give himself to prayer. Watch the disciples. This is early. This is before he's rose anyone from the dead, healed any lepers, healed paralytics, before he anointed them as apostles and sent them out two by two to, to lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, preach the kingdom of God. This is before he walked on water, fed 5,000, fed 4,000. Before he had raised Jairus' daughter. Before he had healed a man with the paralytic hand. Before he had healed the woman with the issue of blood. Need we go further? Before he turned water. Before Jesus had done anything in the natural besides being... To announce to them the witness of who he is in flesh. 
And Jesus would get up in the middle of the night and sneak away to pray. And there was something inside the disciples that would get woken up to. They were so in wonder, wondrous, awestruck, love struck that they would be awoke from deep sleep at the he's not with us anymore. Where is he? Where Simon, wake up, wake up, wake up, Andrew. Wake up, Andrew. He, he's gone. Get get up, get up. We gotta go find him. We gotta go find him. We gotta go find him. They would like, like l- l- see what's happening here. They're dead asleep. Jesus doesn't make noise on his way out. Sneaks away. But something in them could feel presence had shifted. And they got him and said, where is he? We got to go find him. Insert. I like inserting my imagination and play the movie of this going like, Jesus, don't do that again. We've been looking everywhere for you. And then they they realize that they're, 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 you know, uh, uh, accosting the son of God. And then they're able, they go, you know, because they're looking for you. I didn't know, you know, no, don't do that again. If you get up, wake me up. If you're going somewhere, I'm going with you. If you're, if you're not going, if you're going to be up to pray, I'm going to be up to pray. They're, they're so moved by the union that they see in Jesus and that he is announcing to them they're going to be included in that they would wake up in the middle of the night to go be with him. What are they doing? This first love, they are interrupting a prayer meeting that they weren't invited to. Between God. It's God speaking to God. And they're waking up, interrupting a prayer meeting that they were not invited to between God in flesh and God enthroned because I am going to be where you are. It's that first love. It's, it's the awestruck, love struck thing, first dating. Do we remember? Matt, we don't ever see you again. Yeah, because you don't look like her. <laughs> I got called every name. Whipped, added adjectives before that. Did not care. You don't look like her. Oh, Matt, we know what Matt's going to be. Yes, you do. I'm going to be with her. I'm going to be with her at all times. No, I don't want to go to the Applebee's bar. I want to be with her. <laughs> well, you know, you used to, you think you're too good for us. Not, no, yes, I do. Because you're not her. Yes, yes, my priorities have shifted. I've met the one. Yes, my priorities have shifted. We, we, we were together all the time. We, at the time... Because I was such a winner in life, I was living with my parents. And, which if anyone, the full story of that was, I'll just be honest with you, I'll self-deprecation, but I'll be honest. It was a word of the Lord from my spiritual father that called me and said, I felt like you're supposed to move home. And it was for protection. Because I was 21 years old, living on my own. And he said, I feel like protection would say, go home. And that's what fathers do. So I had to make sure Jamie knew that like the second we met. Hey, I'm Matt. By the way, I live with my parents, but it's because I listen to my apostle and I trust him because I don't want to think it. (laughs) I know that my side mirror is currently on right now due to black duct tape, but that is because this, 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 and you know, just make sure she knew. I had a lot of potential. I told her, I said, when I proposed to her, I said, you are marrying nothing but a wealth of potential. (laughs) But Jamie, Jamie literally like would pack bags and just stay at my parents' house. For weeks at a time. Like we were just together at all times. Do we remember this, guys? Like nobody, I'm not trying to be so generic and cheesy here, but like let's be honest about that first love thing. Nobody, when they're talking about the early days of their romance, talked about how easy it was to keep their hands off each other. Oh, it was so easy. So easy to just be away from each other and super easy to keep our hands off each other we just were super tame and normal but this is most people's relationship that they have come into as it relates to the father they can't ever go back to a place of awestruck first love passion they came into keep him at a distance because he's a difficult taskmaster to please 
That's why we have to initiate. We have to start with how good he is. And it begins this love struck thing. Our marriage is supposed to be a witness of union and fellowship with God. She couldn't get enough of me, guys. She could not. She couldn't. <laughs> Make myself laugh sometimes. Then we, so we got a prayer in Mark 1 of, of Jesus leaving, his disciples waking up in the middle of the night to go find him. Then we could fast forward to Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, John 18. And I'm just going to paraphrase. This is in the, the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus on the final evening. He had just had what we would call the Last Supper with the disciples. He goes to a garden called Gethsemane to pray. Jesus leaves the group to pray. He takes Peter, James, and John a little further into the garden. He asks them, stay with me and pray. I need you to pray with me. Bible says he, Jesus goes a few steps further and collapses in the weight of the moment and begins to pray to his father. He comes back and what are the disciples doing? We know the story. Sleeping. Wake up. Stay with me. Tarry with me for an hour. Goes back. This same interchange happens three times. He says, wake up. My betrayer is at hand. I'm be, the, the son of man is being handed over. Listen, th this is so important. Gethsemane means oil press. And this is why the disciples were asleep. In the press, their eyes fell heavy from the weight of the moment. When our tendency is to be casual, to set cruise control, we, when that takes root, when the, the tendency of finding the path of least resistance, we take our eyes away from His glory, from fiery love, and are now drawn into the susceptibility of the moment's weight, Having a voice into my gaze. It comes back to me rather than the us of Christ's fellowship. They went from interrupting a prayer meeting that they weren't invited to. To sleeping through one he was desperate for them to be a part of. He desired for them to partner with him. God's people we have a long history of treating casually what we once cried out for. And as a shepherd over this family, I am at the place. I refuse to let that happen. This is what we cried out for. This is what my dad cried out for. And don't have cheesy religious lenses that looks around and counts people. No, feel the weight of the presence of God in this room. The joy that we see becoming the lifestyle within you and being in a... This is what people have been crying out for. My dad in 97 with my, with my mom when they initiated this ministry in Aubrey. This is what they dreamed of. And a handful of very faithful people over the years have given, have sowed. People that aren't here now, people that have gone on to different places, some that have gone on to heaven, but others, these moved places or different connections. But when they were here, they gave and they sustained to get us to a place of promise. And I have to go, I get to be the one to walk into this. I'm going to see it as a big deal. We have, a, we have a, a long history of treating casually what we once cried out for. Luke 15, we find the religious older brother's lens of personal works, worth, and ultimately offense robbed his heart of the immense pleasure and joy of owning and living in the land of home with his father. Familiarity traps us in a casual posture, which inevitably has the tendency of moving us into an ap uh, um, apathetic one. I am beyond comfortable at home. However, that must move me even more into honor its significance and glory if I am to operate as an heir with access to it all. All that he is and all that he has. Because what happens with the religious lens? And I'm, I'm, Jamal, would you come in? What happens with the religious lens? New smell wears off. 
new smell wears off. So this isn't like a downer message. This is grace. Because what I'm jealous for as a leader in this family is that this would be the least amount of an outpouring that we ever experience again. That where you are right now is the least amount of glory and Zoe life that you'll ever know. That's what I'm jealous for. It's also the promise of the Lord. I've come that you would know life, know it more abounding, more full of glory, joy unspeakable, full of glory, from glory to glory, faith to faith, strength to strength. New wears off. New car smell wears off. New house smell wears off. New friend and friend group wears off. New church smell wears off. New pastor smell wears off. New passion smell wears off. And when those begin to be the most important things in our life, the accoutrements of presence instead of presence alone, like does God want you in nice things yes does God want you in a home yes does God want you to have friends yes does God want you with a healthy leader yeah of course does God want you in a healthy church yes all yes all yes but when those things begin to be overly exalted we're putting weight on things that cannot handle real weight and then we're making them about everything but him not on purpose. It's subtle, seductive, the leaven of casualness. And we start putting weight on people that people cannot stand with. And the reality is a lot of people have come into a moment like this and, and this is it, this is it, this is it. And then we just see God answer needs, God answer prayer, God pour out revival, and then we get into a normal routine. We, we went through that in our marriage. Not Jamie, not that Jamie changed, neither did God. But the she knows how I feel thing. I appreciate no one's amen. And screw you guys. Really? No, she knows how I feel. So the, the, the verbiage changed. The intentionality changed. And casualness set in. The everyday, day-to-day thing set in. She never changed. But my intentionality to celebrate the union absolutely did. Made it about me. Made it about how I was feeling, what I was, you know. This is what we, we've all done this. But when I set my gaze to him and what the Father says about me, something of tenderness began to come back into my heart. And then it absolutely shifted the periphery, brought her back into where she's supposed to be. And now we're in the, I mean, it's just, it's been the great, we're in our 15th year. October will be 15 years. And, and, and the last year has been a dream an Eden not everything working out the way that we think not that we haven't been through heartache not that we haven't gone through challenges but this has never been more um, (laughs) glorious why? because I had to come to the end of me and say I can't treat casually what I once cried out for And I can remember being 20 years old and lonely and sad and all my friends were doing things and I was just sitting there walking around the mall of Denton by myself on a Friday night and I literally was saying, God, if you give me somebody to live my life with, I will treat her like the daughter of the... I I remember praying these things. And then you get those things and we become casual about once we cried out for And I'm just telling you my story, but I've done that time and time and time again with Revival. And I remember just this last week, I, I, 
Easter, Easter was a great day, but I remember coming in here on Sun, Monday afternoon after Easter even and going, it kind of felt a little back to Sunday normal. One, like, God, I, I just, I know you're good. I know there's people touched, but something in my casual, there's something in me that, uh, it was, it went, it, well, you know what it was? It wasn't condemnation. It was me back to those early days where like, where are you? I woke up in the middle of the night. Where are you? Don't do that again. No, you're in the middle of my life. You're in the center of my life. And I can now feel one degree that doesn't feel like it's right where it's supposed to be. And I just want to, no, I'm right back. And now I'm walking this room and I'm saying, God, I remember being, being 18 years old asking if you'd give me a people who would just birth for revival. And I go back to those old testimonies of Bill Johnson where he said, God, if you give me revival, I'll never change the subject again. If you give me an outpouring of your spirit, we'll never change the subject again. And I remember getting those things and then trying to add them to what God was doing or what I was trying to build. And then the Lord in goodness said, okay, then I'm not going to pull that back. But then he begins to pour out his spirit in such a way. And so, so, what, what does this look like? I'm so, oh, Jesus. I, there's two verses I've got to read, guys. 2 Corinthians 4. What is the remedy to casual? We have the same spirit of faith that is described in the scriptures when it says, First I believed, then I spoke in faith. So we also first believed, then spoke in faith. We do this because we are convinced that he who raised Jesus will raise us up with him and together we will be brought into his presence. Yes, all things work for our enrichment so that more of God's marvelous grace will be spread to more and more people resulting in an even greater increase of praise to God bringing him even more glory. This is Romans 8. Things being woven for our good. Verse 16. So no wonder we don't give up. For even though our outer person gradually wears out, our inner being is being renewed every single day. We view our slight, short-lived troubles in light of eternity. We see our difficulties as the substance, substance that produces us an eternal, weighty glory fall far beyond all comparison. Because we don't focus our attention on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what the unseen world and realm is eternal. How does my inner man remain in a perpetual place of renewal? John 7. John 7 says that on the great day of the great feast, Jesus stood and shouted these words, All you thirsty ones come to me and drink. Believe in me so that rivers of living water will burst out from within you, flowing from your innermost being, just as the scripture has said it. On the great day of the great feast, Jesus stood on the temple porch and said, Let all you who are thirsty come to me and drink. And rivers of living water will spring forth out of you. And you will never thirst again. What is the remedy for the human heart's tendency of becoming casual? We drink. We drink. Michael Kulianos, Orlando, Florida, Jesus' image says it like this. This is the end of the lie of dry seasons. If you and I have dry seasons, it is not on the Lord's end. It is our fault. But there is a contingency to the promise of the never-ending gushing water. And it's this. Drink. Drink. This is good news because I told you at the beginning, and we, as we Tarantino a lot of times, my message is we end with the beginning and begin with the end. It's grace. You don't have to get more diligent. You don't have to get more disciplined. God's not asking you to become more prolific and uh, with your, your determination to study. and to, All of those things are amazingly important. 
But the answer for the never-ending renewal is to drink. To come and drink. You'll never thirst again. You'll never be dry again. You'll never be lonely again. You'll never be afraid of losing it again. Come and drink. This is the gospel. This is the good news. And I'm so, I'm so jealous for us to pull as a family, like even the 1% that kind of goes this way, just all of it back, Jesus plus nothing. It's the culture. It's, why we, it's, it's who we are. It's you, Jesus. It's, it's all of us are on you. All of us are drinking deep of you. All of my eye is on you. You are the center of our universe here. There's a really interesting thing. I'm going to get the worship team to come. I just feel like we're supposed to engage in worship this morning. There's an interesting thing here, and I promise you I'm, I'm done. There's an interesting thing here. Read a note that I wrote on my phone. But in Luke 2, Jesus' family journey, and they go to celebrate a festival. Jesus is 12 years old. Jesus is 12 years old. Mary and Joseph travel with Jesus out of town to Jerusalem to partake in a festival. It's time to journey home. And they get in the parade. They begin to walk home. There's a parade, a procession. People are noised. They're caught up. In the, the high of the festival, the high of the celebration. They're going through all that they're going through. It's all honoring to Adonai, all the worship unto the Lord. And three days into the walk home, what do they realize? They have lost Jesus. Like, parents, we've all felt that. Like at Walmart, the twins had a terrible tendency of sprinting full board in different directions one time Jamie was in a Chicago airport by herself Phoenix airport Vegas airport of course she was in Vegas <laughs> she was in the Vegas airport all by herself and Emery was in the stroller she sat Finley down and Finley would do this thing she still does it where she kind of like looks over to the side and she's having that conversation that internal monologue about how quickly I could get out of this she was just kind of doing this and you knew if you didn't grab her right then she's gone and she did this little like step back like where all of her weight's on that back foot and you know moms and dads y'all know that like don't you do it She's got Emory in the car. Like, don't. They're like at McDonald's in the Vegas airport. Don't you do it. Don't you. Finley? She kind of does a. <laughs> gone. <laughs> gone. Jamie has to leave her purse, leave all of her belongings, grab Emory in a football carry, and is sprinting down the Vegas terminal and watches as Finley goes past security down a term tarmac to get onto a plane. Like with a seated ticket, but they spelled my name wrong. I had to go through six different levels of identification. You know, like Jamie spelled my name with one T instead of two T's in Matthew. And they're like, hold on, sir. Do you have any other identification? My daughter just right onto the plane. Uh, guys, my daughter's on the plane. Oh, I'm sure she is, ma'am. Back in the line, you know. She had to go through all of this. I'm at the fire station at the time. It was during when I was still a firefighter and, and medic. And Jamie calls me in like full on. You know, you know. Now make that the living God that you misplaced. Joseph and Mary and Jesus go to the festival, returning home. And while they're returning home, three days into the journey is when they realize Jesus is not with them. And I feel like there's been so many times in my life where I made everything in me about the parade about him. And I never even noticed he wasn't with me. Can we just be honest about that in church culture? How much of the church culture is about the parade about him 
And if he's there or not, nobody would know the difference. I know how to do that. And I'm thankful that a family of people are with me that that is not even a degree of appealing. How, how much how much attention has to be on all the periphery to not notice that the king of kings is not with us I wrote this about fascination and I just feel like the Lord's going to just visit us for, it says the only way we've been taught to remain passionate and zealous is to continually remind ourselves of the hellfire that Jesus rescued our worthless selves from and thus continued the pattern of resurrecting a dead man that kept needing to be rescued in order to remain thankful. These personal revival moments never lasted, and if we're being honest, we knew they wouldn't. And they created a structure whereby we only knew how to closely identify with the Father in desperate need and saw the never-ending cycle of tragedy followed by crying out to God, followed by rescuing, followed by passiveness, followed by a resetting of this cycle. Instead, we are now inheriting a lens of inclusion into the circle dance of union. And while always thankful for what I've been saved from, I am exceedingly overcome with what I have been saved for. To whom I have been reconciled and included with. This focus away from self back to mercy's face fills my heart with fascination and thus welcomes me into the never-ending encounter of renewal. The never-ending personal fire and revival renewed day by day. You and I, friends, were born for more than this. More than just revival passion for a season, things settle down, the storm settles and then I get back to normal life no, there's a company of people who are going to learn how to cry out to God from the glory days like, can, come on, can we, can we what if it didn't take tragedy to find my face on the ground before the Lord, what if it didn't take big needs to get my attention, what if I just learned to come and drink so that I would never be thirsty what if we learned to just go, God what you're doing what you're doing is so beautiful. What you're doing is so glorious. And I do, it's the biggest deal in the world. I'm going to come and drink. Because if you drink, you're never thirsty. Rivers of living water come pouring out of you. So I just want us to stand on our feet this morning. I feel the fear of the Lord in this room. And I want to say to you, maybe you are came into this room. Maybe you are feeling dry. Maybe with every intention and trying, you, you want to be passionate. But maybe like the disciples, the weight of the moment is just making your eyes a little heavy. And I want to say to you, there is no shame and no condemnation, but grace is in this room. There's no shame, no condemnation, but there is grace. So maybe you feel dry. Maybe you are feeling a little bit of casual. Maybe you find yourself focusing more on circumstances and situations than you are the inclusion of the face of God. The glory of the face of God. The great news today is this message is for every person in the room. Because no matter what your situation is, no matter where you are in your journey, the greatest days are you've never felt further away from His face. The answer is simply this, let those come and drink. No matter where you are, no matter what you're still wrestling with, no matter what lies of, of false identity and shame and guilt and not feeling like you'd ever measure up, or if you're in the greatest days of personal union with the Father, the answer is the same for all of us. Let all who are thirsty come and drink. And rivers of living water will spring forth in you and you will never thirst again. You will never be thirsty again. And I felt as a shepherd over this family, this isn't a correction message. This isn't like you're doing this and you're wrong for it. It's saying, I want to be aware. I know what's affected my journey in the past. And I'm going to be resolved in this moment to lean into grace. Not my attention. Not my own ability. But I'm going to lean into grace and say, God, I will never change the subject again. 
I will never change the subject again. If it's just me and Jamie in the room, we are going to be about hosting a measure of His presence that can only be called renewal day by day. I'm not interested in the parade about Him. I want to know He's with us. I'm never changing the subject. Come on. And I just feel the grace to say, come and drink. I feel the grace to say, let's come and drink. So no matter where you are in that journey, perfect, come and drink. Mercy seat. Mercy's face is saying, come and drink. Mercy's face is saying, come and drink. If, if you want to come to the front, come to the front. If you want to engage where you are, also. What I, what, I want, what I want us to do for the next few moments is actually look at Him. Actually see Him. Put Him in the center of your whole universe. And see yourself coming and taking deep a drink. Just love struck. That's how this family is going to be known. Just love struck. Just passionate love struck. Just love struck. Come and drink, says the Lord. That feeling of distance and dryness is a facade. And the truth of His presence is coming. Come and drink. Come and drink. Come on, let's just lift your hands and engage your heart. Come and drink. Let grace fill the room. There's no shame, no condemnation. Come and drink. No, you should be further along. No, that's a lie. You're right where you should be. Come and drink.
I was just hearing the word. You know, there's there is something that happens when you begin to drink. And when we don't know who he is as a loving, near, present father, it, the lie of condemnation comes and makes us run in fear. That's what Adam did. The brightness of God's glory highlighted his nakedness. And so we start doing the cover-up thing again. But when I know I'm fully accepted, because when you start drinking, the Father is going to begin to highlight the things in you that are holes in what, that cause me to spill out what He's pouring into me. Leaky vessels is what the Scripture calls it. That's goodness. Hear me. Love corrects. Love doesn't punish, but love corrects. Parents, right? No, you do not get candy for dinner. No, you're going to do these things. Why? Because I, it's, it's me not allowing Emery to believe she's worthless because she struck out. It's the emphatic no as a father saying, you will not believe that about you. And we're not going to be a people who think we're better fathers than he is. So when the Lord highlights those lies in you, highlights those, those things in us that are out, that we're maybe even finances, that we begin, I'm operating in fear. Or I'm doing this. I'm approaching my wife or my husband in fear or whatever, or pride, whatever it is. When the Lord begins to highlight, it's not to make you feel worthless. It's the emphatic no of grace that says, no more. That's not who you are. Don't run from grace. I'm, I'm, I'm hiding. I'm, I'm putting on a mask. I'm putting on a facade. I'm doing all these things. That's not shame in you. It's grace saying, and I will keep staring at you and telling you that is not your name. Come and drink. Now here's the beauty of what grace says. Grace says this. If Jamie is hearing the Lord say, you're not prideful. That's not who you are. That's not you. It's not up to Jamie to figure out how to not be prideful or how to not feel fatherless anymore. Or to not feel worthless or abandoned or rejected or wounded or left behind. Whatever you're dealing with. The, 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 how do you do that, Matt? What's the answer for what you're experiencing in your marriage and in your heart and your life? Come and drink. It's the answer for my physical body come and drink for my emotional well-being come and drink for my marriage come and drink for my mind come and drink for my heart come and drink come and drink this is what determined this is the only thing and I'm done the only resolve of determination is don't stop drinking your only responsibility is keep drinking on days you don't feel like it drink on days when whispers of things not working out still have the leaven of fear of never measuring up come sneaking in you have a responsibility friend to come and drink and he promises no more crying out for rain to fall you get to live by what flows from within in the wilderness they asked and needed things to fall you and I in this wilderness get to know things are brewing within you set your own thermometer come and drink so father we thank you this day i thank you for a family and i say the emphatic we will never change the subject again whatever that looks like we will never change the subject again we want to host a measure of your presence that is renewing us day by day and our hearts say yes to the never-ending encounter our marriages say yes to a never-ending love encounter. Our physical bodies say yes to the never-ending encounter. So we come and drink deep. We come and drink deep. No more dry. No more roller coaster. No more emotionalism. Come and drink. Just come and drink. No more worthless feelings. No more feeling of abandonment. No more fears of rejection or being let down. Jesus, we see the Father that you imaged perfectly. So we come boldly, but it is a huge deal that we do. Thank you. We ask for
for grace right now, God, that every degree of casualness is being conquered in us as we see the brightness of your presence. We come boldly. We don't come casually. We don't come flippant. It's a big deal what you're doing. So, yes, we will rearrange everything to be a part of it. Yes, we will rearrange everything in our world to say if you're wherever you are, I'll wake up to be with you. I thank you for the greatest days of first love, deep encounters. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And I just, I'm the, in final, I want to say this, husbands, and if you're single in the room, engage with the married couples by, by praying over them. And know you're prophesying over your own, celebrating your, your future relationship. Join us. But married couples, I want us to join together. I want to bless you with the first love again. This isn't to make you, oh, I'm single. No, 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 no. Engage with the Lord. It's okay. Marry him first. I'm, this, but we, we've got to image a better, a better way. So, Father, I pray over the marriages in this room. I pray condemnation, fear, pride, and wounds of division being healed in your presence this day. I pray the greatest days as our first love encounter with you. Let that trigger such an overflow of first love, deep honor and reverence and awe and celebration of the love that you've given us by way of our spouses. We thank you. We need a revival in our marriages, King Jesus. In your awesome name. Amen. Amen. We love you guys. We just honor you. We love you. We need for the greatest days we've ever known. Amen. Amen. We love you guys. We'll see you this week.